Okay, and I'll also go ahead and open up a Revit model. Why don't you, if you'd like to follow along, you could follow along in your own model, or if you want to follow along in the same model I'm working with today. If you go out to the L drive, you'll actually find under Cats Glen and then uh, session nine, you'll find something called, oh, what is it? It's like um, 10, <coughs> 8, 10, 19, 10, oh, medical lab or something like that. Go ahead and open up that one. <laughs> See if you can find it out there. So again, it's going to be on the L drive. It should open up and look something like this. Let's see if you can find it out on your machines. Beautiful. Okay. So let me just kind of walk you around the building a little bit so you know what we're working on. This is a little medical office lab down in San Jose. It's a real project that hopefully will be built someday. It's been through planning and lots of approvals. Sort of got stopped at the financing stage because when everything sort of went south a few years ago, you know the the sources of funding sort of like uh, became much more tentative. But hopefully this thing will get built. This is a little lab that's really intended to be. Um, it's the place where if you go to the doctor and they take some sort of tissue sample from you, they send it to this lab and here's where they actually mount it on like glass plates. Okay, that then get sent off to some lab for analysis. So it's a histopathology lab. They work with little tissue samples. But in terms of what actually is necessary for the space, the only important thing you need to understand about it is, oh, if you look down at the first floor plan, there's kind of a big lab space over here. It's really just a lot of lab benches. Oh, there's some more workspace back here. Up front, we have sort of an office space, a little conference room space, a stairway space. Upstairs, the second floor, there's really, more than anything, a large office that's set up for the owner of the lab. Okay, there's a little employee workroom towards the front of the building. And then there's this fantastic terrace that goes all the way around. There's not much roof. It's all terrace, okay, like a big balcony. So if we go out to 3D, you can kind of take a look at it there. Orbit around there if you like. Sort of perceive it from different sides. Another way you might want to look at it, just sort of get a sense of it. We've actually set up a lot of different uh, 3D views already. There's, oh, from the street towards the driveway. That's just kind of a camera view looking at it kind of towards the driveway. This is kind of from the parking lot looking towards the entrance. We also have a lot of interior views, you know, of the conference room. Oh, in the lab area looking towards the lab benches. Oh, towards the whole lobby and stairs, towards the offices over there. There's different views that are all set up. So this is where you've been so far. You've created 3D views, you got things set up, and we're going to start actually rendering these views now. We'll render some of the exterior ones, and we'll start rendering some of the interior ones next time. Okay, let me go back out to my exterior views. We'll take a look, because really where it's going to start is just with the whole issue of the materials. Now, to start with, Okay, Farzam had a very good point. You know, rendering really at some levels is point, click, and let it rip in terms of what's going on. And it really does sort of work that way. So let's show you what I mean. Here we are in this the 3D view. Rendering is actually just one of the choices. It's down at the bottom. It's only in a 3D view you'll get this little guy that looks like, oh, a teapot. You choose the teapot. This rendering dialogue shows up. If we ignore most of the stuff that's in here for right now and we just say render, I'll let that go, but I'm going to do it sort of at a low quality so it happens relatively quickly. Let me render it and let me tell you what's happening as it's doing it. As it goes through and renders, what it first does is it takes a look at the model and it figures out where the sun is right now relative to the model and <coughs> first goes through and computes for all the different surfaces that can be seen right now really what is the intensity of the light on each of those different surfaces. So first it figures out the brightness of each of the surfaces. After it does that, it says, okay, for each of these different surfaces, let me figure out how that surface is painted, what sort of photographic image of a color or some sort of material is going to be on that surface. And then I'll take that, brighten it to the appropriate level, and paint that pixel with that color. Okay. So there's a lot of computation that goes on in the background, and that's what's happening right now. Okay, It's doing it in several passes. It did sort of a first pass very quickly, then it went through and did a second pass. 
And at some level, this is a rendering of the building. Okay, you know, it's sort of that simple at one level. Oops, let me go back to the rendering dialog. Show the rendering. Okay. Now, this isn't necessarily the best rendering in the world in terms of, oh, if you look at some of the diagonal lines, you'll see they're a little bit rasterized or jaggy. The railings don't look so good right now. Those sorts of things are an issue of just really the quality of the rendering. So at a low level, we get sort of lines that don't quite look so good. Even in terms of the windows and the reflections and the transparency of things, some of those things aren't as good as they could be. As we go through and we ratchet up the quality, those things will get fixed. Okay. Another thing that you could look at in terms of this is just sort of how the sun is hitting it and the overall brightness. You'll see the sun is kind of, oh, it's somewhere up here. Okay. And we'll learn how to set the sun either by saying it should be at a fixed location relative to the view or how we can actually say for a specific place on Earth, for a time of day and a time of year, how we can set those things and just have very accurate shadows. And that's very useful because then you, know, you get very accurate renderings or you know, even an illustration of how your shadows will affect other buildings and other buildings will affect you. Yeah, Reto, I thought. Is this your question like the sky, is it automatically there? Yeah, well, the sky is actually here as a blue sky right now. Let me kind of warn you about that. Because yeah, the blue sky should be there. It's one of the rendering settings, but let me kind of warn you about that. In a 3D camera view from the ground, the sky will show up. In a 3D view, which is an orbited view or a bird's eye view, you won't actually see the sky. What you actually see is just gray, which is actually sort of the ground terrain. Okay, so watch out for that, because that sort of got, gets us. You know, in a camera view, there actually is a line in the horizon. It's gray below and it's blue above. In a 3D orbited view, a 3D default view, even though you sort of think you should see the sky in the background, you don't because the, what is it, the, it's infinite. The ground plane is infinite. So the only way to really sort of see sky is to get down to a camera view instead. Okay, but we can go ahead and control the sky and determine whether it's going to be a pure color whether it's going to be cloudy. This is sort of few clouds. We could have no clouds all the way up to very turbulent, very cloudy sky. Okay, But before we get to those rendering things, eh, let's go back over here. No, I should, should keep, shouldn't keep on turning that thing off. Before we get to those things, let's just go ahead and focus on the materials themselves. Do we really like the color of that wall? Do I like the color of these uh, window frames? How about this material over here that's supposed to look like some sort of stone. It's <coughs> rendered very kind of awkwardly right now, but we'll learn how to sort of change those materials. So we're going to start with the issue of just how are materials assigned and how you can control those things. Okay? And it always takes a little bit of detective work. Once you can do your detective work and figure out how they're assigned, they're easy to change. But it, you have to do a little bit of digging to figure out where that setting is coming from. Erin, did you have something? No. no. Okay, no worries. Let's pop back over and get you started on materials. The idea is with materials, there's a hierarchy to how materials get assigned, and you need to know about that hierarchy. Materials are always assigned in this hierarchy, and really the material that will be picked up by the object is the setting that sort of showed up at the lowest level in the hierarchy, the most detailed part of the hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy is just this whole notion that every material or every object has some sort or can have materials assigned to it you know, just by its <coughs> object. And that's called an object style. If an object has no materials assigned to it at all, it'll be gray, just kind of a default gray color. Okay. If you have in your project set up that you want a certain style for, oh, you can say all the furniture should be something, <coughs> or all the floors should be something, or all the walls should be a color, okay. it'll pick it up by category and the material will come that way. So if you haven't assigned it any other way, you get things at the object styles. Okay? Deeper in the hierarchy, we'll actually learn that you can set things as type properties of all the different objects. So for example, as you're looking at the little picture over here, each of these different objects, the bookcase object, the couch object, the little chair object, they have type properties. And you can open the type properties and assign the materials at that level. Okay? And that's usually the way materials get assigned is typically through the type properties. Some objects are actually defined even a little bit smarter. They're set up that lets you to let you change the materials on an instance by instance basis. And those are really very, very handy for you because I can take a single object 
And instead of making duplicate types to have two different materials, just one by one, I can say, oh, this table over here is going to be a bamboo surface. This table over here is going to be a concrete surface. This one over here is going to be a glass surface. And really just use the same object three different times, but just assign the materials one piece by piece. And the very final level of the hierarchy is something called painting. And painting is actually probably the trickiest one, because painting sort of overrides everything else. It's a little bit hard to tell when things are painted. They usually figure out things are painted because you did everything else imaginable, and it still wouldn't change its material properties the way you thought it would. And it will finally occur to you, oh, maybe this thing is painted. Okay, Painting doesn't actually change the actual object, it just puts a thin veneer of some sort of appearance on top of everything. Okay, and yeah, that's good and very, very handy for you sometimes. It's not so good for you sometimes. But let me give you a positive example of where that may actually come in handy, just to kind of motivate it in the right way. If, for example, I was modeling this room, or all the rooms here in the building, and you know, this wall over here I wanted to have an accent color, because for the most part, all my interior walls are this kind of creamy, Navajo white sort of color, and that's kind of okay. If I wanted this one to be gold or blue or green or something like that, okay, I could go ahead and define a special wall type and assign the color green to the surface of it. So I could have green gypsum board or blue gypsum board or gold <coughs> gypsum board. Okay, but that probably wouldn't be, you know, that would get sort of just old really quickly if I had to create different wall types for color. You know, that's not really a great way of using wall types. Okay, we can paint color onto walls. What we do is we can define a material called accent one, assign it a color of red, and I can just put it on one surface of that wall. It won't change the other surface, it's just changing this one surface of the wall. Okay, and that won't show up in any schedules, it won't show up a lot of different places, but it lets me very quickly change the appearance of something. Okay, and you'll find that painting sounds kind of bad, but it actually turns out to be sort of a very handy thing to do too. So I'll leave it at that for now. Let me switch back over, and we'll come back into the model and take a look at these objects and see if we can do a little detective work to figure out how they're defined. For example, we've got this wall over here. You might have noticed that wall kind of rendered itself as some sort of creamy, tanny, just some sort of color in there. Let's see if we can figure out where it's getting that material. I can choose the wall. And one of the most common ways I do my detective work is I just say, let me start by looking at the type properties. I know that walls have a structure and I have materials on the inside and the outside of the wall. So let me take a look at the outside surface. Okay. There's some surface called finish exterior stucco. Okay. It starts out with this kind of, uh, kind of tan color. It has this sort of speckled pattern on the outside of it. That looks pretty similar to what I'm seeing over in the 3D view, so I suspect that's actually where I'm getting it. Let me kind of zoom on in, back check back out here. Speckled, kind of tan. Not exactly ex the same color of tan, because what happens is in the 3D view, it's actually shading it. So say I get a slightly different tone over here than over here. That's based on just the lighting conditions. Okay, so it's lightening up that color a little bit. Okay, but I think that's the one. Now, once I've done my detective work, and I figured out that that thing is defined by a material called finishes exterior stucco. I can keep on going this way, or let me show you a much quicker way to get to that material. Yes, for some. Right. Can, can you go back to the dialogue? Oh. Ah. I'll show you that in just a second, because we'll get to the, the dialogue the other way. And since I know it's finishes exterior stucco, I can just go say, let me go directly to materials. <coughs> Okay, that'll save you some time. It's just I'm going to go out to the Manage tab, and then Materials right there. So I could find that finishes exterior stucco in the list. Here it is. Okay, this is the one Prasam's asking about. So let's kind of like uh, tell you about what that's all about. If you remove the check mark, what's the difference? Well, let's show you. Okay, if I remove it and I change the color. Okay. And I say OK. OK, OK. I've changed the shaded appearance. It's green. No worries. Let's go back. Exactly. But it's still going to render as this tan material. 
Well, the nice thing about that checkbox, what it does is it makes sure that the shaded appearance and the rendered appearance are always somewhat in sync with each other. Okay, so if I actually want that to render properly, what I'll do is I'll change the render appearance. I can take a look at the color of the stucco here. Maybe make it this nice aqua, which isn't so nice, but I'll go ahead and put that on there so you'll see it. If I come over to graphics, because it says use render appearance for the shading, what it's going to do is it's going to take the image and sort of really abstract the strongest color in the image and use that as the render appearance. Okay, So I'll say OK. I got my aqua building here. Let me go ahead and render that. But that's really all there is to changing materials. It's always go through, dig around, see if you can figure out really what the material is that's applying. Okay, and then once you do that, we can go through and just change this thing called render appearance and just map it to some sort of different photo appearance. There's a library of photo appearances we can choose from for different materials. And we're also going to learn that you can actually create your own. No worries. OK, so we got those. And there's my uh, aqua building. Now, the neighbors might not like that. So I might have to choose something a little <laughs> bit different. OK. It's a very happy color. Actually, one thing I should comment about, because as you travel the world, you find out there's a, you like that? It is actually not too bad. There, there's a very different color sensibility in different parts of the world. So never make a presumption, because as you travel around, people feel very, very differently about color. We tend to be very staid and subdued in the US for the most part. But if you go traveling around to a lot of, you know, there are some vibrant colors out there that make people very happy. And you know, so never presume about color. There's no bad color. OK, let me change the render appearance for my stucco again. Let's say instead, let me replace it with one of these other ones. Oh, I'll go for, oh, blah, 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 like this olive colored one. Something a little, a little more. Yeah, that's not a very pretty one either. But <laughs> it'll go. I'll say, let's go to the render appearance. You sort of see it still, sh it sort of abstracts that color. OK, and if I show the model. Okay, it'll be that kind of more olivey colored one. Okay, so some things you can find just by opening the type properties and you'll figure it out that way. Another one that's a really good one to figure out through the type properties is, for example, the mullions. So let's go ahead and see if you can sort of get the, figure out what material is assigned to the mullions. Let me zoom on in there. I might have to do a little hovering and tabbing. Let me hover, there we go, get that guy. I'll open its type properties. I'll take a look. It is actually defined by some material called sash metal. Okay, let's go out and take a look at that material. So I can go through and I can change the sash metal right here by clicking it, and it'll open the materials <laughs> property. Or since I know it's sash metal, I can just go out to materials and change it that way. It's just two different ways to get the same thing. You'll see here it's assigned to some sort of terracotta-y brown color. And I can change that to a different <coughs> color. Oh, if I want that to instead be, oh, well let's say, oh, what do I, I don't want blue. Blue will be too much. With that. Sure. Actually, let's do that. Why not? Oh, white, right kind of color. Let me change over. You can see the shading is going to be that ivory color, too. We'll say OK. OK, and that changed. You notice, though, actually several things changed. OK, and this is kind of a point about your materials and how to think about them. You know, often, we don't go through and assign every color individually. We often think about colors as serving certain purposes. So that color, that color which I'm using for the mullions that I called metal sash, okay, I'm actually using it in a couple different ways. And this is just sort of a modeling choice. I've used it as the edge of the roof, kind of like I'm going to wrap the edge of the roof in a piece of metal, a little fascia there to kind of keep the color the same. I'm also using it for the actual color of the sash of the windows. So that's also coming from that same material definition. Okay, and I can work with those together. 
And that's sort of an important point I want to drive home about these materials is you can assign everything independently, but the problem with doing that is it's almost making every individual decision too important. When we design, we tend to think of them things together. You have the primary color, then you have an accent color. And then you use that accent color on a number of different things. Or even as we look at the furniture in this room, you know, we could go ahead and specify every surface of every table individually, but there probably actually was just sort of the cabinet color. And there was a countertop color. And it's actually useful for you to define your materials that way, to say there's the kitchen countertop color. Okay, then you can assign it to granite or laminate or whatever you want. You can assign the kitchen cabinet color, okay, and let that be birch or maple or whatever you want. And then if you change that material, okay, it'll change everything else that has been assigned to that material. Okay, so it's a level of indirection, but it actually gives you some power. So I don't want you to think of materials as literally being that specific material, but think of them in terms of the use of the material. Okay, and that'll actually, that, that level of abstraction actually buys you a lot of power in terms of being able to kind of uh, separate. Yeah, what's on? If you make a change to that window, does one make the change of which tone or the light of which window darker? If you change one of the windows, is the color change all the windows and all the... Yes, and that's only because, because I've modeled it that way. Well, let's talk about it. Because it's designed as a type property, Okay, all the different windows of that same type will inherit that. Yeah. So if you don't want it to happen that way, if you want to have one that's special, okay, yeah. what you would do is. Actually, I want you to show us just the one that changes everything, and if you can show us how to do it. Sure. Which is the one that is going dark. No worries. Okay, so what I will do is I'll choose that window. I'm going to do it in the 3D view because that window is actually arrayed right now. So I have to do something where I have to choose it. Yeah, and open the array. So I have to edit it so I can actually get to the individual window. That's only because I have those three things arrayed together into a single group right now. Okay, but I'll choose that window. I'll look at its type properties. Okay, and in the type properties, you'll see that it's sash metal. Okay, so I have a choice now. One question is, as I change the color of this window, do I want it only to affect all these windows, or do I also want it to affect these mullions over here? Okay, because if I change sash metals definition, it'll change all three of these things. If I want to have a special color just for the windows, independent of those, okay, what I will do instead is say, okay, I'll go to sash metal, but instead of changing its appearance itself, I'll duplicate it, Sash metal, I'll call alternate. And then I can change that appearance to be, oh, like blue, so you can sort of see it. Again, not because I like that color so much, but I think it'll be easy for you to spot. Now, because I changed it, okay. Or it's really, it's because over here, when I, what I did was you know, I, I changed the type definition. Just a single one. Okay. And if I want to have two different windows, what I can do is duplicate this. Actually, since I'm in group mode, I can't do that right now. I'd have to ungroup them to do that. But I could change individual ones by basically making a new type and assigning different materials to that type. So that would really be the essential difference between the two different types is the different material. No worries. Okay, so there's this funny point about really at what level you want to change things, but your whole exercise is really trying to understand your model, figuring out where that material got assigned. Once you figure that out, it's pretty easy to change the material. Okay. It's just sort of, it takes a little detective work to figure it out. Let me give you one more example. One that's kind of particularly interesting, I always find, is the railings. Because railings, they do have type properties. And you see by default, it's just set to by category. So in terms of why is that railing black right now, it's really not by a materials assignment here. When it says by category, that means we're going to go up the hierarchy, and it's coming out of the object style. So instead of looking at the individual railing, I can say manage, and one of the settings is object styles. 
You'll go down and you can see that in the list of objects there actually is a material called metal railings assigned to all the railings. So if railings don't have any other materials, it's going to pick up this render appearance, which is this black paint. Let me go ahead and replace that with something else just so you can see it. I'll make it the red paint instead. Okay. You notice that I changed the railings out here. You know, if you're very eagle-eyed, you might have noticed that it actually changed the railings inside too, because railings are railings, if I haven't defined those properties. If I want to keep that set of properties and just defo use the object ones, I can. If I want to, I can go through and edit the type properties. And I don't have to keep them all set to by category. I can make a choice, oh, let me say metal top rail. Okay, and I can go through and just give that one piece a different color. So I'll make it this kind of cafe color. And notice that for this one railing over here are all the railings of that type, okay? That top rail has changed. Okay, so you can really get incredibly fine levels of the control. It's just you gotta go through and dig around and figure out exactly which piece is controlling what you're defining. Notice it actually didn't go through and change the railing inside here because that's actually a slightly different type. Okay, so a little bit of detective work on your part. Let me show you instance properties. Instance properties. It turns out you have to go hunting around to find objects that really let you define themselves or define them in terms of instance properties. But let me show you a couple that do. Let me uh, load a family up. I'm actually going to go to my little uh, 110 library and find there's some casework that I had to define a couple years ago that had that property to it. Now, where to go? Cabinetry down here. We actually had someone who, when she did her kitchen, she wanted all the different cabinets to have the ability to kind of change the colors of the different panels. She was going for sort of a very, you know, colorful, and kind of very playful scheme. So we actually changed some of the different materials or properties so that you could actually change those uh, one at a time. So let me place some of these cabinets and show you what ha how it works. I'm just placing these wall cabinets on the wall there. Right now, they're just kind of showing up with this kind of default gray material right now. No worries. If I choose one of those, I can go ahead and take a look at its instance properties. You'll see it actually does have some properties even at the instance level. Ca uh, instance level, cabinet box versus cabinet door frame. So if I want to take a look at cabinet box, You'll see it's just kind of gray right now. Oh, let me go ahead and give it some sort of color. I could even give it a pattern, like plaid. Okay, it's just going to render, hopefully, as kind of a red color. Okay, it's changed them all right now because all those cabinets were set to use cabinet box. Okay. If I go back and change again one of them, instead of cabinet box, I duplicate that. Where'd it go? I'm call it color two. And I change that to a different one, like denim. It's again going to be the blue. Yeah, I'm going to change it to something different. That's not going to be hardly visible. Okay, kind of brighter yellow. You see, I can change them one at a time. So the n a nice thing about objects that have been defined individually is that you can change them one at a time and kind of really not have to create different types for every color that you need. The disadvantage is that you have to change them all one at a time, as opposed to just kind of changing them as an entire class. So you can decide really which ones you want. It turns out most of the, as you go work doing your work, I think you know, almost 90% you know, of what you do will be involving changing type properties. 
Okay, and then it'll sort of pick up from there. Okay, last thing we want to show you to get you going is the whole idea of painting. So let's just kind of show you what that looks like. There are actually some painted surfaces hanging around in this model, and I did that because it was a very quick and expedient thing to do. If you go clicking on that wall that doesn't look like it's responding to the stucco, you'll see that it sort of should be the stucco wall, but it doesn't do what you think it ought to be doing, and that's because it's been painted. It's kind of my quickest way of kind of really quickly playing around with the idea of putting stone in some parts of the structure. Okay. So what we've actually done is we've painted that wall with a different pattern. How do you paint a wall? It's pretty simple. You go over to the Modify. There's this tab called Paint, or tool called Paint. And if you choose it, you'll see it's currently painted Finish Exterior Stone. But I could actually go through and paint any other pattern I want onto it. That's the mullion color. This is the door hardware color. Now, it's still default gray, so I'm not choosing, I'm not doing a good job of choosing different colors. That's like a glass block. Okay, I can paint individual surfaces. Okay, and as you're painting things, you are painting individual surfaces. You're not going through and painting the entire object. That's actually sort of a good question. When I have a transparent material, that's interesting. It's, I think it actually is giving me us the transparency. Now, I would say that's kind of a bug in terms of what it is, because if I go to the other side, it actually isn't painted on both sides. <laughs> let, me, let me keep going. I'll, sh I'll show you. Because <laughs> it'll just take me a while to navigate there. But actually, look, let me do this. Let me say brick on that side. Now, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll do it for you. Hang on. Just for you. Okay, glass block on that side. Let's see if we can sort of make this work. Okay. When you want to go and looking in that building, how could I do that? Let me go ahead and do this. I'll duplicate it. In this version of it, let me go view properties and I'll use the section box. That's gonna be the easiest way for me to get inside there and take a look. So view properties. I'll turn on the section box. Let me bring down the top surface of the building. I'm trying to scalp it. See if I can orbit this around a little bit now. Oops, that one there instead. So see, it's sort of looking opaque on that side. Let me go ahead and paint the inside and then paint the outside two different colors. And it, it's a little bit weird painting with a transparent color. This goes that sort of when it, you're sort of messing with its head is basically the way to explain it. Uh, let's put brick on the inside. It's sort of transparent on that side. Yeah, so yeah, I'd, I, I'd say that's a bug in the scheme of things in terms of doing that. If I actually made it a true wall and I actually made the material all the way through, it'd give me the right behavior. So I think your, your eagle eyes have spotted a bug in the program. Because okay. it really does maintain every surface independently. This whole technique, though, is actually a good one to let you know about. If you want to change the surface appearance of a wall real quickly, for example, you know in that big lobby space you just want to make that wall green or something like that. Why not? We'll go through and we'll define a material. I'll go ahead and say, oh, let me give myself some new color. I'm going to call this wall accent one because I'm going to just have an accent color. Again, notice I'm staying away from actually calling it green because I tend to think of it as it has a function. It's an accent wall. And I may use that and later decide that green's not my best color. So I will replace that. I'll go to the paints. Then I can paint that wall green. Oops. Let me go back to my painting. Change it over here. 
and what I call it wall accent one. There we go. I could paint it green or I can paint that one. Okay. So this whole technique, and you may use this as you're working with your thing, use the section box, kind of bring things down so you can get to your walls. You can't paint in a 3D perspective view. I'll warn you about that. You have to be in like one of these orbiting views and kind of cut things away. <coughs> it's one of those things you can't do. Okay, let's go ahead and do this. Why don't you hop on up? We'll take our break. Uh, be back in five minutes. When you return, we will continue with one last thing with the materials, and that is the notion of if you got some materials and the ones in the library really don't suit you and you'd like to create your own, how do you do that from an image that you found on the web or using your camera or something like that? So we'll